The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Thought provoking. Informative. Engaging. Are you ready to be inspired and equipped? And now, The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Welcome to The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort, where we're back for more action, and hopefully we'll get some traction for your satisfaction. Why am I in a Dr. Seuss mood today, Ray? <laughs> no. Neither do I, but I better I'm, snap I'm out not, of it. Yeah, you better. Yeah. I like that tie, Ray. It looks really nice. You can have it if you want. Yes, I'll take it. Mark Spence, how are we today? Good. That was probably one of your better rhymes because it used more words. Yes, <laughs> I know. I got to get with it. Well, friends, we are excited to jump into the topic of the day. We got some interesting stuff for you, and hopefully you'll be able to stick with us. This is from Austin, a high school senior. What do I say to Hopefully someone? Hopefully you better stick with us. <laughs> it's my hope. We can hold their attention. What do I say to someone who thinks that the universe was made by a God, but then was left on its own to function, much like a clockmaker and his clocks? He fashions it, puts the mechanisms inside so that they can function as a whole, turns the crank, and then watches his creation work, but doesn't intervene in its process. I am not sure how to answer this, so I would appreciate some advice. God bless y'all. No doubt where Austin is from. Ooh, maybe Austin, Texas. Somewhere down there. So, Ray, that's uh, the um, whole de uh, deism perspective. Mm. It's God idolatry. That's all it is. It's uh, creating a God to suit yourself, a God that has no moral uh, attributes, a God that winds up humanity and who is a monster. I mean, this is the sort of God that Richard Dawkins should leap at and complain about because this God gives us no explanation of where we came from. He gives us no explanation as to why there's suffering and he gives no remedy for the suffering, no hope for the future, no hope for death. Right. It's just a wind up humanity and away you go over the cliff. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a violation of the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, small g. You shall not make yourself a graven image of any likeness. And uh, this is what happens when someone says that. They make a god in their own image. They can snuggle up to a god that has no moral dictate, and it's very comfortable. And I love how Mark always poses a question with these things, with a question. What do you mean by that, or where do you get your information? Because when you go down the road of, this is what I sense, well, anything goes. You know, what if... Uh, God is a genie in a bottle and he lives underneath the earth and pops out of a volcano and swims oh, in the ocean and that's a good one. flies in the clouds and <laughs> God yeah. and on we can go. Yeah, I get atheists are often saying, which God? Which God is right. it? There are lots of gods. There are not lots of gods. There are millions of gods. Hindus have 450 million gods they've made up, a God for everything. And so uh, before I was a Christian, I was an idolater. I had a God that I prayed to every night. My aunt at the age of 11, not my aunt, but me, taught me the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't the Lord's Prayer, it's the Disciples' Prayer. A lot of qualifications Yes, today, a lot of qualifications. <laughs> Keep qualifying each and sentence, I, right? I, I rattled off the Lord's Prayer for about 10 years. That's not all at once. Um, every night <laughs> for about 10 years. <laughs> and I couldn't get to sleep unless I'd said my sleeping pill of our Father, what in heaven, help me with the name. I'd zip through about 10 seconds. Wow. And it meant nothing to me. But I believed in God, but it was a God who was a figment of mm -hmm. my imagination. Well, not really my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> green, this is the qualification green zone. Green Acres. Remember Green Acres? Oh, yes. and green Acres. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. But Mark, how would you tackle this? I mean, you've got someone who is throwing something out like this at you. And, you know, even some of the founding fathers of our nation uh, were known to be deists. Right. And so maybe you can shed some light on this. How would you deal with it? Drop the bomb. You know, you hear atheists come along and say, listen, I'm an atheist, but believe it or not, you're an atheist as well, Mr. Christian. I just happen to believe in one less God than you do. Hmm. To which I say, oh, I know I believe those other gods are gods. Lowercase g. Hmm. Everybody believes in the God of the Bible, even at that, though. Because Romans 1 tells us that, and that's how I know that to be so. Uh, George Sweeting, he said, what do you conceive God to be like? Some would say to believe at all in a personal God requires a giant leap of faith. But I'm convinced that belief in God is a far more reasonable position than atheism. Nature, the personal experience of literally billions of people, and something innate in the heart of man all testify 
to the existence of God. Now, you, you kind of stole my thunder in that, you know, I use the Socratic method a lot, and that is you respond with every question with a question. You answer questions with questions. So if they were to um, bring forth this objection or this question, I say, hey, where do you get your information from? You say God sort of wind, wound up the universe and then he stood back. It's kind of like the guy who you grabbed a hold of the bowling ball. I've used this. They, I've heard this illustration as well. They grab a hold of a belt bowling ball. God's thrown it down and the ball's going to go wherever it wants to go. Mm. And God is impersonal as he set the ball in motion. So my question is, how do you know that to be so? Could you be wrong? Where do you get information from? And do you care to hear what the Bible has to say concerning this topic? If they say no, I say, well, have a great day. You know, God bless you. Go your way. I'm only interested in people that are interested in really in what the Bible has to say at that point. So, but I, I don't necessarily have to pose it like that. It just depends on the circumstance and the situation. So where do you get information from? Could you be wrong? Yes, and so could you. Well, how do you know I could be wrong? You have to be omniscient in order to know what I know. Let me tell you what I believe, and then you can tell me your thoughts on that. And you always stick, because we're Christians, we always stick to a biblical worldview, and we extract from the Word of God that which is there. Never put into it what we hope or want it to say. It's never safe. It's always dangerous. We always got to pull from that which is already there. Yeah. You know, that bowling ball analogy is quite good. This, this world is like a bowling ball, and it's hit those ten pins of God's law and <laughs> knocked them down, right. the whole ten of them. Um, years ago hundreds of years ago when I was a kid, uh, there was a song called The Desiderata. Have you ever heard of it? No, I've heard of The Desiderata, though. No, Desiderata. It was a song, <laughs> the words of which said, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive Him to be. Right. And that, that sums up idolatry. Idolatry is so attractive to humanity because, as I mentioned before, it releases us from moral responsibility. Uh, when Moses was up the mountain getting the law off God, Israel was lawless. So what did they do? made an idol, and then took their clothes off. Right. They, they had a big party, and that's exactly what America has done. We've forsaken the God of righteousness, we've forsaken the law of God, get rid of those Ten Commandments, and we take our clothes off, sorry, they take their clothes off as a nation, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they're partying, not realizing that that law is written in stone for a reason. Yeah. It's not going away. Uh, Romans uh, 1 verse 12 and uh, James 1 verse 12 says that law will be the standard that God will judge with. For as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by that law, will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. And so we must warn this world that they're not getting away with a thing. Yeah. And even when people will make reference to the law of God and say how unfair it is that God would impose his laws on us, first of all, that's insane. Mm -hmm. Because in saying that, they're <clears throat> acknowledging the existence of God. And if God exists and he's sovereign, which he does and he is, than to in any way insinuate that he has no right to impose on his own creatures, his own law, is ridiculous. Isn't it? And yet at the same time, those same people impose many laws on many people, whether they're parents or whether they're employers or whether they're in any position of leadership, they have a structure in which certain laws or rules exist and they impose them on others. And so there's a contradiction there and it's ridiculous. But one thing I'd be interested in asking someone who's a deist is this. This God whom you believe created the universe and then set it in motion, is he the God of the Bible? And if their answer is yes, then my next question would be, where in the Bible does it tell us that he set things in motion and let it go? And if they say it's not the God of the Bible, then I'd say, well, then where do you get your information about him? Right. So, so those are ways that I think you can approach it. And, and also talking about the law, James calls the law the perfect law of liberty, and it's the law of liberty for a reason. Uh, where law is, there is liberty. Where right. there's no law, there's chaos. Take that to a mm. football game. If there's uh, complete law-abiding players on both sides, there's no transgression. It's a free-flowing game. Right. The law produces liberty. If there's transgressions, they stop for penalties, and it's a, it's a mess. And that's exactly what's happened in America. Because we've forsaken the law, we've become a chaotic lawless nation right. with millions of people in prison. Our, our prisons are overflowing. There's, there's so many laws on the books because we're forsaken God's law. We're trying to clean up the mess after, yeah. the, after the kettles got out of the, the gate. Is right. it cow? Cow? Yeah. Cow? Yeah, I don't know what got out of the gate. <laughs> cow. I've been here 24 years and I still can't speak properly. Right. Right. Yes, we know that. Mm. But see, friends, freedom <laughs> entails responsibility. Freedom doesn't mean getting to do whatever you want. Freedom means having the ability to do what's right. I remember as a Christian, 
uh, one day as a, having as a Christian, as a Christian, okay. as a Christian okay. one day having an epiphany <laughs> that I no longer had to be enslaved to the sins that at one time controlled my life and dominated that's me. And, and the light so went on. And I remember one time I was tempted and, and I was about to go down the road that I would go down when I was in the world. And I stopped and I thought, I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. I don't have to do that which destroys me. That's nothing. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had the same epiphany, seriously. Yeah. When I, when I became a Christian, I thought, I don't have to get drunk on Saturday nights. I don't have to do this, don't have to do that. I'm free. Surfing had me by the throat. Mm. I used to love surfing, but I realized that, that my ego, I was ego-driven. Right. Like almost every athlete, what do they want to win the race for so they can get the cups, they can get famous, so people can look at me. Yeah. And, and that's what drives so many people when it comes out. We're ego-driven. And I thought, this isn't good, and I can't take my family surfing. I'll just give it up. And I gave right. it up. Right. The things that God works in your heart when he transforms yeah, you. Yeah, he, he gives you the desire to do what he wants you to do. It's kind of tricky, yeah. but nice. Yeah. yeah. No. Changes your desires. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to now go to a video of Neil deGrasse Tyson. And then Mark Spence is going to give us some comments on this video so if we have it let's roll this video at any time when we have the capacity and capability <laughs> to roll it so that we can all watch it and people can see it so please let's go ahead and roll the video I'm often asked uh, and occasionally in an accusatory way are you atheist you know the only ist I am is a scientist all right I don't associate with movements I don't I'm not an ism I, I just I, I think for myself the moment once someone attaches you to a philosophy or a movement, then they assign all the baggage and all the rest of the philosophy that goes with it to you. And when you want to have a conversation, they will assert that they already know everything important there is to know about you because of that association. And that's not the way to have a conversation. I'm sorry, it's not. I'd rather we explore each other's ideas in real time rather than assign a label to it and assert you know what's going to happen in advance. So what people are really after is what is my stance on religion or spirituality or God. And I would, and I would say if I had to find a word that came closest, it would be agnostic. Agnostic, a word dates from the 19th century. Uh, Huxley. Uh, to refer to Someone who, who doesn't know, but is, hasn't yet really seen evidence for it, but is prepared to embrace the evidence if it's there, but if it's not, it won't be forced to have to think something that is not otherwise supported. Okay? There are many atheists who say, well, all agnostics are atheists. Like, okay. I'm constantly claimed by atheists. I, I, I find this intriguing. In fact, on my wiki page, <laughs> I didn't create the wiki page, others did, and I'm flattered that people cared enough about my life to assemble it. And it said, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an atheist. I said, well, that's not really true. I said, let me, uh, I said, Neil deGrasse Tyson is a agnostic. Went back a week later, it, had been, it, it, it said Neil Tyson is an atheist again, within a week. And I said, what's, what's up with that? And I said, I right, now I have to word it a little differently. So I said, okay, Neil deGrasse Tyson, widely claimed by atheists, is actually an agnostic. And some will say, well, that's, you're not being fair to the fact that they're actually the same thing. No, they're not the same thing, and I'll tell you why. Atheists I know who proudly wear the badge are active atheists. They're like in-your-face atheists, and they want to change policies, and they're, they're, they're having debates. I don't have the time, the interest, the energy to do any of that. I'm a scientist. I'm an educator. My goal is to get people thinking straight in the first place. Just get you to be curious about the natural world. That's what I'm about. I I'm not about any of the rest of this. And it's odd that the word atheist even exists. I don't play golf. Is there a word for non-golf players? Do non-golf players gather and, 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 and strategize? Do, do non-skiers have a word and come together and, and talk about the fact that they don't ski? I, I don't, I don't, I can't do that. I can't gather around and talk about how much everybody in the room doesn't believe in God. I, I just don't, I don't have the energy for that. And so I, agnostic separates me from the conduct of atheists, 
whether or not there's strong overlap between the two categories. And at the end of the day, I'd rather not be any category at all. You know, Neil likes to take the safe road, maybe even the higher road, you might call it, and claim to be an agnostic. Well, I have news for you. God doesn't believe in agnostics either. Hmm. An agnostic comes along and says, listen, I think it's a safe position to simply say, none of us know. Not just myself, but nobody really knows. And I guess we'll find out when we get there or when we don't get there because there's no place to get to. He doesn't want to be on the bandwagon. He doesn't want to state what he believes. Well, really, he has joined the bandwagon by being on this YouTube video, which has the potential of bringing down or attempting to try to bring down the faith of many different people. Whoever jumps in and watches the video, I don't know how many people have seen this video, but it's out there for the world to see. It still begs the question, though. There's so much moral responsibility that he's going to be held to. So many questions that are unanswerable within his worldview, such as, do you believe in evil? Is there right and wrong? Is there good and bad? He can't say, yes, there is evil, because once again, whether he's an agnostic or an atheist, there is nobody to tell him what is right or wrong. Now, God, in his infinite wisdom, has written his law upon the heart of every man, woman, and child called the conscience. That is how wonderful he is that he would do such a thing like that. But I'm curious if I were to ask him the question, you know, what evidence would be admissible in the courtroom of your mind, Neil, in order to determine that there is a God? Because he said he hasn't come across any evidence. I dare to say he lives with the evidence continually. He right. says, I just think. I just want, I'm a thinker, and I want to cause other people to think. Well, you can't give an account for your thinking without hmm. including God in the midst of the equation here. It's because of God, everything makes sense. Without God, nothing makes sense. You're left to your own evil imaginations. And you won't seek after God. It doesn't matter what you do or how hard you try. But the truth is, God has revealed himself inside the Bible. Mr. Scientist, you have to humble yourself the same way we have, and the same way countless other millions of people have down through the ages. And if you're willing to humble yourself and come to your senses, repent of your sins, and place your trust in the King of kings and the true God of gods, then he will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You claim to be a scientist, and I'm sure you are an amazing scientist at that. But have you bowed your knee? Doesn't seem like it, but you can. It's not too late mm. to bow your knee to him who is knowledge. He is the all-knowing one. And that is what he's left with, and that's what all the atheists and agnostics alike are left with. They're left with God. What are you going to do with this one who is not the king of small kings, but the king of capital kings? Hmm. where all kings will bow down to this king. Wow. Life is quick. Wow. I would have liked to have heard him come out and say, atheists are lying about me. Right. But he didn't. He <laughs> says, oh, they've got it wrong. They're saying he's an atheist, he's not. And also, he was saying, atheists say all agnostics are actually atheists. It's the other way around. All the atheists are actually agnostics because they haven't got all knowledge. Right. So they default to agnosticism. Yeah. But agnosticism is just as foolish as atheism. It's like you've got the, the atheist who says there's no evidence the building was built, hmm. and the agnostic who says, I don't know if the building was built. Right. It's just crazy. <laughs> Every building is proof there was a builder. Buildings don't build themselves. Yeah. And nature could not have built itself because if nature created itself, it had to be pre-existent to create itself before it created itself, which is scientifically <laughs> ludicrous. I love it when you throw that down. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously we've seen the evidence that Neil deGrasse Tyson is claimed by atheists. It happened in Evolution versus mm -hmm. God. And uh, so it, it's, it's amazing to me that someone as brilliant as him, and again, he's brilliant. Uh, he's he refreshing. I mean, yeah, seriously, he he's knows. a very delightful guy. He's easy to listen to, sharp as sharp can be. But, but again, it amazes me that it doesn't come down to one's intelligence or brilliance or wit when it comes to salvation. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a new believer, I got so excited because I had a lot of friends growing up, and, and I was typically a leader among my friends, and they would typically follow me in things I did, and I thought, yeah, all my friends are going to get saved, woo! I mean, it was a foregone conclusion. I knew yeah. it was going to happen. And when I went to them and shared the gospel and told them what happened to me, and they did an about-face and just abandoned me, I thought, yeah. what in the world happened here? 
full thing. It hurt, Ray. <laughs> You're laughing. Can I help it? But it, it really, again, is a reminder, friends, that salvation is of the Lord. And God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. So, you know? Neil, get off the grass. Yeah, Neil, get off the grass and stop <laughs> being so smart. Neil, before God. But, uh, but yeah, um, you know, it, it's, it's just amazing when you imagine people living a life surrounded by the reality of God's existence yeah. and yet denying it. And that leads us actually to our next question from Ernesto. I was studying the chapter in your school of biblical evangelism where you talked about how we know God exists and how we know by creation and the things that were made, Romans 1.20. I've wondered if you ever use the creation of life and its complexity in your witnessing, the thought of how our bodies are made up, and to say that they were made out of nothing is really absurd. Do you think this would be an appropriate way to witness? What do you think, Ray? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I was just talking to a guy w within the last hour, and he was saying, you know, I said, um, do you believe in the Noahic flood? And he said, no, Rick, flood. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, 70% of the water's here. I had, the earth is 70% water. Where did it come from? And he said, well, there was these, well, the thesis is, the theory is these two <laughs> big asteroids collided and and the water got here like that. And, <laughs> and I says, well, it, the water's teeming. The seas are teeming with life. Where did the life come from? And I said, there's no such thing as a simple cell. Uh. The most simple cell is incredibly complex. Life cannot come from life, uh, non-life. That's a scientific impossibility. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Right. Um, no, that's, yeah. Something but else. Something sounds good. Yeah, yeah. sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Hey. We have a scientist in the room who's just thrown Oh, we do have a scientist. Oh, boy. Yeah, he's going to come get you, right? Yeah, no. Um, anyhow, friends, yeah, I think it's an excellent thing to point to God's wonderful creation. Again, we've established this time and again here on The Comfort Zone. Everyone knows that God exists and that Ray Comfort laughs. We all know that, of course. But we know God exists. People know God exists. But there's nothing wrong with glorifying God by pointing out the wonders of his creation. Absolutely. I'll often do that. I'll tell people, I say, you know, your brain has over 100 billion um, nerve cells or microscopic nerve cells. It has many times more nerve lines and electro than all the telephone lines in the world put together. The electrical signals from 200,000 living thermometer cells, a half million pressure sensing cells, plus three to four million pain sensing cells, including all the signals from your eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds are all routed to your brain that keeps everything in your body working in perfect order and harmony. You know, I mean, think about that. The, the, I am thinking yeah, about think. it. Your, yeah, think. Your eye, you know, it, it has over 137 million light-sensitive cells. The focusing muscle in your eye moves an estimated 100,000 times a day. Your eye has a built-in super-sensitive light meter, immediate automatic, automatic focusing, wide-angle lens, and full-color instantaneous reproduction. Right. You know, what camera would you compare the eye to? What computer would you compare the brain to? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And then I'll go off into a silly poem that I wrote years <laughs> ago about creation. You're going to do it? Shut yes. up. Yes, do it. Okay, let's see if I remember it. Here we go. Just read the prompter. <laughs> Roses are red. <laughs> all right, Mark. Ah, all right. There's no prompter. Away you go. Sit there nice and smooth and calm. He is jealous of your memory. Okay, let's see if I can remember it. Here we go. Who can tell me where I came from, the little boy would ask. His question was a good one, yet he faced a trying task. Each man had different answers, as he was soon to learn. This brought him great confusion, and it caused a deep concern. He first went to his schoolmates and they spoke with one another. I know, said the brightest one, you came from your mother. Now this had satisfied him, yet only for a time, for as he grew year by year, his thoughts began to climb. He then looked all around him at all that he could see, and his mind began to wonder how it all had come to be. He thought about the universe, the span of outer space, and every star and planet that exists in every place. He thought about the rounded earth, its tilt and its rotation, and all the seasons that occur in yearly circulation. He thought about the darkness and he thought about the light. He thought about the sun and moon that rule the day and night. He thought of all the creatures of the land and sea and skies, of all the different species and their variance in size. He thought of all the plants and trees and all that each provides, each growing from a tiny seed with roots the soil hides. He then looked at humanity, the sea of different faces, different tongues and characters from many different places. He thought of mortal bodies with features so profound and the sense of taste and touch and smell and sight and sound. He thought of reproduction and the miracle of birth. He thought of human life itself and all that it is worth. He, can, he then considered human will, both the weak and strong. Something like that. You're doing good, easy. It's a long life. time since you've done this. He thought about the conscience that discerns the right from wrong. Right. He thought about emotions and feelings that arise. He thought about the love and hate and tears that flow from eyes. He thought about the anger and the joy that does abound. He thought about the happiness and sadness that is found. 
And filled with curiosity, this boy would daily strive in hopeful expectation that his answer would arrive. So he spoke with scientific men who claimed his question solved. They told him of a real big bang that all things had evolved. He then spoke with philosophers, heard some of them insist that there's no true reality and we do not exist. He spoke with many people from various groups and sects and heard the vast opinions of various intellects. Now baffled by confusion, a very troubled youth, unable to discern what is error, what is truth. He almost gave up looking, but he took a second look and very unexpectedly he found a special book. As he gazed upon the first page, he knew his search was done. His questions all were answered in Genesis chapter 1. With a nod of understanding, he smiled so elated, for now he surely knew, in the beginning, God created. Wow. I can't believe I was able to make it through that. You know what happened is we made some modifications to it for the, yeah. you know, where, where we put it. And, um, and then I've been trying to re-memorize those parts, so my mind was throwing me off. We put it in the Evidence Bible. Right. It's just a wonderful yeah. part. So I've been trying to get that straight. But there and you have it, It's only one of many that you have. He's a treasure chest of, uh, of wisdom. Well, you know, I found things like that help people make a connection. Yeah. You, you know, you get someone's attention, you're able to give them the gospel for a good amount of time. And Mark, you would agree with that, illustrations, things like that. How important is that in evangelism? Oh, Jesus did it time and time again. I mean, that's really why we have parables. And when given the opportunity, I mean, use them to your advantage, absolutely. Right. Roses are red, violets are blue. Some poems rhyme, some don't. <laughs> that's all you're getting. Oh boy, Ray Comfort, one of a kind. So friends, we hope today you've been encouraged, that you've been stirred, and that uh, you're brought to a place where you recognize that God wants to use you in the midst of this lost and dying world. So study to show yourself approved. Get illustrations and scriptures and biblical truth and knowledge in your heart and mind so that you can get it out to the world. And as always, remember, we've brought you into this comfort zone to get you out of your comfort zone. So get out of there, friends, and preach the gospel for the glory of God. For questions about the comfort zone with Ray Comfort, or to submit questions for future shows, please email us at email at tczlive.com. That's email at tczlive.com. The Comfort Zone is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel. So we're from Canada, we're here on vacation. We are so excited. We ordered over 500 movies of the 180, which is incredible. And we actually we just bought, finished handing out 300. Yeah, it's them. amazing. We have like $1,000 worth of trucks. We're so pumped. And we, um, we, which, just, we took the basic training course. We and taught we just it, to our, church, it the, to our church. They just graduated. We're so excited. And it's incredible. And lots of souls are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Incredible. Okay, we've been evangelizing for over seven years. And within like one hour, it's within the seven years of trying to bring people yeah. to Christ. It's like a, it's a, it's a revival. Like yeah. it's incredible. It's it a works bomb of so revival. Amazing. If anyone has not taken this course, you've got to take it. It has changed our lives.